Power and Authority of the Word A Lecture by Charles Fillmore When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, Shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Matthew 8 verses 5 to 8. The central idea of this scripture is authority. It should be interpreted from two viewpoints. First, the working of ideas in the mind of the individual, and second, the outflow of thought to the world. The Bible should always be read as one would read a great drama. Star actor depicts and expresses certain ideas of universal import. The whole life of Jesus was a drama, and in the lesson today, the star actor is playing a part of such character that its motif moves to higher action the whole human family, which must be taken into consideration in our interpretation. It is far more than a Shakespearean play, for it enters a realm of consciousness that Shakespeare only now and then touched. In the Shakespearean drama, the story is told in words and acts intellectually expressed, but everything originates in man's spiritual being, and in this scripture is portrayed a still deeper scheme of life, a scheme in which the spiritual I am, represented by Jesus and its faculties, the disciples, are healing the multitude, multitude of thoughts. We are told that Jesus entered into Capernaum after coming down from the mount. This has a spiritual significance, as it depicts the movements of the spiritual ego. Jesus went up in the mountain to pray. Here is designated a realm which is higher than the conscious mind. Jesus called this superconsciousness the kingdom of the heavens. Entering into this consciousness is going up on the mount. After we have ascended into this high place in consciousness and opened our minds to its ideas, we are charged with wisdom and power. We can then come down again into the realm of things temporal and their exercise abilities above mortal understanding. When we do this, we must work in the terms of the absolute. Then, our healing is effective and our power is amazingly increased. Many very spiritual people have this experience on the mount and are thereby made stronger in consequence. Some are stronger in love, others in wisdom, and others, looking out upon the world with broader vision, see themselves even as new creatures in Christ, but they do not always exercise their spiritual power in service for humanity. Capernaum means comfort. It is that thought in us that wants to serve and to comfort the repentant. It means that great sympathy which goes from us when we see the needs of those about us, and with this sympathy comes the desire to help. This is what Jesus illustrated in washing his disciples' feet, the necessity of humble service in doing God's work. But man should not be so humble as to lose his innate authority over the carnal mind. If, in our service, we are not conscious of all our abilities, we are apt to fall into negative thoughts about man's power and thereby lose our dominion. When we sympathize with error in a negative way, we submerge the consciousness of spiritual authority. According to Genesis, in the very beginning, man was told that he had power and dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the cattle, and over all the earth. Everything is subservient to man when he realizes that his power is through thought, not muscle. There is an omnipresent substance which is plastic to the molding touch of faith working through thought. This substance responds to our lightest word and moves to action in the invisible forces that make for our health, happiness, and prosperity, if we so decree. The ambition to command and enforce obedience has been found so universal that those who have possessed authority have not always used wisdom in exercising it. Instead of forcing measures through the dominating will, one in the understanding of the supermind gains the desired end by handling the thoughts lying back of the appearances. The metaphysician denies the appearances of sickness and stimulates the thought of health. This is not mere mental suggestion, but, in order to be effective, the denial and the affirmation must be based upon the understanding that sickness is an error condition and health the correct expression of principle. This law can be successfully applied in any department of life where trouble seems dominant. The rule is, deny the error and affirm the truth, or minimize the trouble and magnify order and harmony and perfect action. Samuel M. Van Klein, president of the Baldwin Locomotive Works, in an article in the magazine System, entitled, Why We Are Ready for the Unexpected, 
says in substance. The way to get things done, the way out of difficulties, is, on the one hand, to minimize the difficulty and, on the other, to magnify the self-reliance and resourcefulness of those men who are actually in charge of that particular work. Machinery to make a certain kind of wheels for the shipload of locomotives for which ships were waiting to transport them to South America broke down, and the foreman said it would take 30 days to repair. The delay would cause expenses that would take all the profits. Something had to be done. The men were worried and anxious and berated everything in sight, including me. I told them to forget it and go home. Apparently, we were up against it, and so I went to the theater. When a man does not know what in the world to do, it is not a bad idea, I have found, to go to the theater and try to forget business. I do not know what the show was. It does not matter. I did not see much of it anyway. But between the acts, it dawned upon me that a year or so before, the government had sold some old ships to a junk company nearby. I remembered that they had just the steel bolts we needed. I was up at four o'clock the next morning, and as I dressed, I said to myself, you are a lucky dog. You have three meals a day, and nothing to worry about, and nobody to put it up to you to provide steel hammerheads. I was soon at the junkyard, bought the steel at a bargain, and by noon of that day, the hammers were in full play, and we were getting out the locomotives. Mr. Van Klein further says, in substance, Trouble is arising every minute of the day in every big concern, and it is human nature to try to shift the cause onto someone else. As a little bit of trouble makes its way towards the head executive, it grows until it assumes vast proportions. My policy from the time I learned of some of the duties of an executive is to place the responsibility on the men doing the job. But to some men the trouble seems so big, they will not look for the solution. But you change his viewpoint if, when a man of this character comes to you with a problem, you just grin and say, well, what of it? If you don't know what to do, go and do something anyhow. Then that man will think that you do not regard his difficulties as overpowering, will know that you have confidence in his ability to find a solution, and will be put on his metal. Instead of gazing at his trouble from every possible point of view, he will forget the trouble and go hotfoot after the solution. If one has not knowledge, then enthusiasm will not meet the difficulties. But with knowledge and an absolute determination backed by tradition, anything can be done. If the directing head refuses to acknowledge the presence of trouble, keeps his own feet on the ground, and treats everyone around him as a human being, fully equipped with brains, then these people will be human beings fully equipped with brains, and they will conquer all the apparent difficulties. Here you see the intellectual side of authority, the power of an executive mind using the higher law based upon principles which govern in real authority. This authority has back of it a science just as exact as mathematics or electricity, a science which works without being directed, when the right ideas are brought into action. Edison is accepted authority along the lines of electricity. Why? Because he has made a study of this science, and his formulas are accepted as authority over formulas whose authors are not so well equipped. But in the exercise of his authority, the spiritually minded man does not assume to compel people to accept him as a standard. He deals with ideals, and at the same time gives the supreme power opportunity to assert itself in his mind. Carlyle was a discerner of mind and its laws. He said of moral force, Above all it is ever to be kept in mind, that not by material but by moral force are men and their actions governed. How noiseless is thought! No rolling drums, no tramp of squadrons, or immeasurable tumult of baggage wagons attends the movements. In what obscure and sequestered places may the head be meditating which is one day to be crowned with more than imperial authority? For kings and emperors will be among its ministering servants. It will rule not over but in their heads, and with these its solitary combinations of ideas, as with magic formulas, bend the world to its will. The time may come when Napoleon himself will be better known for his laws than for his battles, and the victory of Waterloo prove less momentous than the opening of the First Mechanics Institute. Is not this a lucid and powerful exposition of the powers of mind? The thought and meditation of some obscure individual is building authority through his mind, because all authority comes from mind. Empires and kings are eventually to be ruled by these ideas of this obscure thinker. When we study the mind of Jesus Christ, we see that he must have had a realization of a mind capacity far beyond that of the ordinary individual. He said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, 
but my words shall not pass away. His was undoubtedly the greatest mind that this world has ever known, and those who study his life and follow his advice will become, as he said, the light of the world. When the centurion came to him asking healing for his servant, Jesus was not aware of his power to heal people at a distance until the centurion called his attention to it. The centurion said, Say the word and my servant shall be healed. Then he went on to tell how he, too, was a man under authority. He said to this man, Go, and he goeth. And he said to another, Come, and he cometh. Then he told Jesus that he could operate the same law on the spiritual plane that he, the centurion, used on the mortal. It was through his word of command that the centurion exercised his authority, and he knew that Jesus was dealing with a like power in a higher realm of action. Jesus was astounded, but he saw the point and said to his followers, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Then he said to the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And the servant was healed in that hour. From this narrative, we perceive that we often get lessons from those we serve. If the teacher's eyes are opened, and if he is meek enough to receive, he is instructed by everyone who comes to him for healing. But there must be the open mind, which is the basis of good spiritual work. Jesus had a great faith, but he had not exercised it fully. He did not come into a knowledge of his spiritual powers all at once, but there was a gradual unfoldment. Jesus advanced in wisdom and stature. It has taken the followers of Jesus nearly 2,000 years to awaken to the faith which he taught and demonstrated. It is only in the last half century that metaphysicians have asterisk found that they can speak the word and heal patients at a distance. In truth, we are all in mental conjunction. Spirit knows no separation, but individuals in sense consciousness do not understand this. But the truth is that, in its final analysis, the whole universe may be so condensed spiritually that it can be balanced on the point of a pin. Space is the related condition between things. It is through the spiritual realization of omnipresence that absent healing is done. When man realizes omnipresence, he is instantly in the presence of his patient. He has full understanding that in spirit there is no separation, that we are all one. This is the very foundation of all authority of mind over matter. But once set up the thought of separation, and you will be a slow healer. Every problem that confronts us may be easily and successfully solved if we make it a rule to minimize the seeming difficulties and magnify the ability to overcome them. The petty troubles of the day will increase if we let them worry us. But if we assume the mastery and quietly say, None of these things move me. I am the masterful resource of spirit, and all things are obedient to my loving command. They will quickly harmonize and pave the way for greater conquests. Metaphysical healers find that their success is wonderfully increased when they minimize the tales of woe told to them by their patients. There are various ways of doing this, and a wise practitioner uses the one best suited to the case in hand. Sickness seems very real to the patient. He has built it up in his mind until the mental side is greater than the physical. Consequently, there must be a break made in the thought before the thing can be reached. Silent denial during the recital is generally used as a dissolving thought, to be followed by the assurance that the trouble can be easily overcome through the power of God. But let every healer use the method that inspires him at the time. In the case of the centurion, Jesus took advantage of the man's great faith in the power of the word of command. He had seen Jesus heal by merely rebuking the disease or commanding it to come out of him and he compared that authority with his own in directing his soldiers. Jesus was a discerner of thoughts, and he commended the centurion's great faith and lucidity. The one thing that those who follow the great metaphysician should make fundamental in all their work is that everything, whether in mind, body, or affairs, has back of it and, within it, a mental cause. Everything that exists has a measure of intelligence. It will listen when communicated with on its own plane of action. There were no diseases before man, hence all discords of that character are thought aggregations. This accounts for the ease with which metaphysicians handle some complaints that are pronounced incurable by physicians. Such troubles are undoubtedly heavily charged with mentality and respond when told of their unreality. But when diseases are described by the doctor in formidable terms and given some long Latin name, 
they become greatly puffed up and attain a stronger hold upon the body. A puffed up condition in the body always indicates pride. So instead of talking about the swelling, deny it and tell the flesh mentality that it has no cause to be puffed up, but rather to be meek and receptive to the restorative power of our good mother nature. This kind of treatment will reduce swellings and prevent soreness. However, soreness must also be told that its feelings are not hurt. When one is sore over some injury to mind or body, he will have a sore place in his body nearest to that center of thought. Even the soreness from accidents can be effaced by the word of denial, to be followed by affirming the loving, harmonizing, healing presence of the Holy Spirit. Only say the word, and my servant shall be healed. The servant of man is the body, and all bodily ills can be done away with by speaking, either silently or aloud, words of truth. End of lecture.